Okay, welcome. Thanks everyone for joining part three of Fear and Loathing of the Esoteric. I'm excited to get into it. Today I'm coming from a little Airbnb in Healdsburg, the Riverbell. And the reason I'm here somewhat relates to the subject of today's topic. So we'll talk about that, but it's very, very beautiful here. It's by the river and uh, it's a wonderful little, little town. Great place to come and restore. It's full of nice little restaurants and a town square and ice cream shops and that kind of good stuff, which is an important part of accessing the mystical. You know, don't don't forget that part, but don't get stuck there. So uh, just a little recap on our previous sessions and what we covered. I started kind of giving you some of my personal story and how it was that I came to be interested in the esoteric, the mystical, the magical, the spiritual, and uh, how I found it to be a source of, of power and joy and beauty and truth. And then we looked at this notion of uh, conservators and adapters, or perhaps better put as adopters, those who um, want to retain what, what they have and the way they do things, and what, those that are seeking new models and new ways of uh, doing things and, and adapting to new circumstances and how they interact in this great display. And then uh, last time we looked at sort of some of the containers for exploring the mystical and um, how some containers are sort of considered acceptable and some are treated with suspicion and, and where is that appropriate and where is that not appropriate. And then we looked at the recipe. You know, if there is fear and loathing around a topic that's considered esoteric, that's considered novel, um, how do these things get attacked? Um, and I said that the key, the key parts of that is the, the intentions of who's cooking and what their motives are and the ingredients. Does it stack up? And we looked at Sheila Kelly's S factor as our model for exploring that. And in this talk, I'm gonna talk a little bit more about why do we bother with the mystical? You know, why um, is it of value to us and in our lives? Why should we explore it? Why should we care? Why should we care when it's being infringed upon in ways that don't seem to, um, uh, that don't seem fair or don't seem right or don't seem healthy. And um, and then we're also going to talk a little bit more about uh, um, schema, which is a concept that's related to containers, which I'm excited about. So uh, so the reason I'm in Healdsburg is yesterday we drove down from Fort Bragg uh, to Alameda, and which is a little island. Uh, that adjoins Oakland in the Bay Area. And we were traveling there for the what's called the Pari Nirvana of the Venerable Gyatrul Rinpoche, I'm probably pronouncing that incorrectly, who's a senior lama in the, the Nyingma school, which is one of the four major schools of Tibetan Buddhism. And this one, Nyingma, literally means the old school. It's, you know, it's literally old school. Uh, so it's very traditional and 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 very old uh, lineage um, of Tibetan Buddhism when Buddhism came from India across to Tibet. And the oldest monastery in Tibet, uh, Samye, is uh, from the from the Nyingma tradition. And so this this Rinpoche. So what is a Pari Nirvana? That is uh, the state of Nirvana after death, which occurs on the death of someone who obtained nirvana in their own lifetime. And that means uh, a, a release from samsara, which, which is like the wheel of suffering, the wheel of struggle of life, um, from karma and from the, the cycles of endless rebirth. And so uh, he, he passed away recently and entered the state of um, Pari Nirvana, which is a very auspicious time in, in this school of Buddhism, and I think in other schools, to um, do rites and prayers and rituals uh, as this person is, is um, 
is 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 in this in this process and so um and a little bit about this this teacher, um, Gertrude Rinpoche. I wasn't very familiar with him prior to this, but he he fled Tibet during the Chinese invasion, like many of the spiritual leaders. He lived in India for 12 years in Dharamshala. And then he came to the West at the, at the request of the Dalai Lama. And um, although the Dalai Lama is from a different school, the Gelukpa school, um, he is and for centuries has been the the symbol of the unification of Tibet. And so, whatever school you're you're in, the, the Dalai Lama kind of uh, is um, treated as a, as a um, spiritual guide to each of them and a symbol of reunification. And so, he came out to to the West, established this this monastery um, in Oakland or in Alameda, Alameda, which which we were we were at. And Kathleen Ivanov, who leads our sutra studies, uh, ha has had a lot of experience with that tradition, and she spoke about it very beautifully on our last sutra study. And so those of us who wanted to went along to do these um, practices. And the, um, the monastery is called the Orgyen Dorje Den, and it's, the, the, it's a temple dedicated to Vajrayana Buddhism. Um, and the temple itself sits rather fittingly. It, it was a mortuary before it became a temple. And this line of Buddhism, um, you know, doesn't have the same, uh, well, I think all lines of Buddhism, but particularly this one, doesn't have the same fear of death and fear of crossing over and fear of the, the next world as, as, as we typically have. We, 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 treat death with the kind of um, fear and loathing and repulsion that has it hard for us to, to engage with it. So, um, yeah, so off we go down to this, this place. It was a long drive, a couple of hours. And, uh, you know, we get there slightly late, unfortunately, a couple of minutes late. That was my fault. And you walk into this temple and the walls and the door frames are this beautiful, rich red, and there's gold trim around the frames. And then you take your shoes off and you put them at the racks and you walk over to the main meditation hall. The experienced practitioners would, would bow down and touch the floor as they walked in. And there's two very large gold seated statues and they're very tall and maybe like 20 foot high. And there are pews, which are kind of like church, but on the ground. And everything is red. It's all covered in this red fabric and cloth. And there's red um, zafus that you, you sit down on. And on the walls, there are these silk tapestries with various figures from this lineage, sort of an enlightened deities from, from the Nyingma lineage. And in front of you, there's a there's a kind of a book of mantras that you recite as part of this um, process of the practices and offerings for the Parinirvana. And so I walk in there, and it really felt a lot to me like um, the Anglican Church, which is what I grew up in. You know, my um, my grandfather was an usher, and my parents went, and it was really sort of a communal space for us. And you would go sit in the the pews and you would see the minister and his robes up front, which are actually not very dissimilar from the robes that the, the, um, the lamas and the other lay practitioners were, were wearing. And you kind of sink into this space, into the space of, of um, beauty. And then along the sides, we didn't have all of this in, in Ranfontein, South Africa, but there's an AV guy and there's, uh, someone with a with a drum that that sort of beats the drum at various points, and it's just this beautiful experience that kind of washes over you. And and um, throughout the uh, throughout the ceremony, there are uh, people coming down the aisles with um, water with saffron, which you would uh, drink some of, and then put it on your head, and and various other things, and sort of. The analog for me was uh, the the altar boys and the Anglican bringing bringing the ins, incense up and down the the um, the aisles and the sacraments and and so uh, 
that's that's sort of what I experienced yesterday. And I can tell you that when I arrived and, and on arriving there, I really didn't feel uh, moved by the mystical at all. That was just not the mental state that I arrived in. And frankly, during and after, you know, I just kind of felt a little overwhelmed. I felt like, I hope I'm going to get this right. And I hope I'm not going to make too many kind of protocol faux pas because there's a lot of sort of protocols and history and ways that you do things inside of these spaces. And it reminded me of my first demonstration of orgasmic meditation, which I, which was back in 2013 in London in a hall there. And I felt similar feelings. It was, it was clearly a ritual. It was clearly something you were intended to sink into. And I felt these feelings of like confusion, of numbness, of judgment, even of irritation. Um, and I think what, what happens for me there, at least, and I think for a number of other people, judging on how they <laughs> they react to these kinds of these kinds of um, places, is that there's a there's something subterranean and non-rational that's activated, and it it sort of sets the non-rational part of the brain and the rational part um, into a, into a state of heightened activation. Both of them in kind of different ways and sometimes going kind of at odds to each other. And it's this kind of stirred up activation that enables what in esoteric practice they call the unaya mystica, which is the absorption of the soul into something more transcendent. And this is the kind of union that I was introduced to and that I... Um, uh, when that I found at at one taste and which I had glimpsed before, but really found like, wow, this is a state that is worthy of pursuit and practices that will bring you to that state are worthy of my time and worthy of my attention. But it comes with this kind of stirred up feeling where there's a simultaneous feeling of, of attraction and joy and beauty and repulsions and judgment and fear and hatred. So I bring that experience up for two reasons. And, the, and the, one of them is, is just this notion of, of parinirvana, this notion of nirvana, that over the course of a single lifetime, that you can wake up, that you can achieve full realization, that you can escape all of your uh, karmic knots and past baggage. Not escape is the wrong word. Um, you can engage with and be with um, all of that. That is uh, a very radical and revolutionary idea, but it was an idea that that sat at the heart of One Taste um, and of all its curriculum and of all its training and of everything that it did. Um, and one of the things I want to talk about a little bit later is that One Taste tried to curate as not a single point of access um, but as many possible access points to the state as, as existed, really. There was nothing, there was no area that was like, you know, we won't explore that one or that one's, as long as it's sort of from a do no harm perspective. And um, so that you can live in a state of like full electricity, full aliveness, full awakening, um, with everything, which is which is great in in theory, but in practice, it can be easy to be like, that's impossible. I can't even get along with the person next to me. You know, now you want me to be a you know in in a state of full awakening around climate change or school shootings or like the cynicism can can creep in to to um, when confronted with that kind of notion that that's even possible. So, um, and that is exactly what I confronted the second that I walked into that room, because part of me just wanted to instantly disengage and dismiss the whole experience as quickly as I could with as little time and mental effort as was possible. 
because when you're you're confronted with something so clearly rich and so clearly complex and requires such clear effort to bring it into realization my mind at least balks at that and says if i have to handle this on top of everything else that i'm handling in my life and like somehow absorb whatever truth is in here um i already feel overwhelmed and so i want to kill it and i want to cut it off so that i don't have to think about it so i don't have to be confronted about it and i think this is why we as a culture we develop this kind of presumption of guilt for anything that doesn't conform to the concrete reality that we've already created for ourselves i mean we've invested in certain things that we found to be valuable and then we you know we don't we're we're competitive beings by nature we don't want to feel that there's a realm that there is access to that uh, I can't access because it's beyond my capacity or it's it's beyond my willingness. And so that was kind of what I was facing in myself. And I'm, you know, all these things like I have to give a talk about the esoteric and the mystical tomorrow, but now I'm in this esoteric mystical Buddhist experience. And it's kind of getting in the way and I feel overwhelmed by it. And yet at 11 a.m., here I am, I'm going to have to say something. And it wasn't at all what I, you know, I had a whole plan of quite complicated things I wanted to talk about. And and um, so there's this way you have to like break open to allow these things in and to allow them to move you and to allow them to to um, to take you somewhere new. But it's also a border. It's a border. When you walk through the steps of that temple, you're walking from the border of one realm, which is the streets of Alameda and where you parked your car and the bakery across the road and the town hall into this mystical realm. And those borders are important. They're at least important to me. And, um, you know, and anytime there's a border, there's an opportunity for whoever is manning the border post to extract a price. And there are spiritual realms where once you enter, they do give you something beautiful and, and wonderful, but they, they, they extract their price from you. And so I think it's a worthy field of investigation to look at, well, all these, these, you know, these priests, these teachers, these shamans, who sit at the border, how do we kind of, for lack of a better word, police what they do while allowing them to do what they do? And I think our um, model for looking at the border guards is, um, is, is limited and lacking. And it's kind of what I want to, to address if I can. And I, I have a great sort of love and hatred for borders because that's what I grew up with. I grew up traveling around South Africa and going to many different Southern African com countries, Malawi, Zimbabwe, um, Lesotho, Zambia, um, Mozambique, um, Kenya, Uganda, Tanzania. Actually, I have, didn't make it to Uganda. And I can tell you that when you arrive at the border post, that is a state of heightened activation. And on the one hand, it's very, it's a very rich and evocative experience. You know, all the truckers are gathered there, people are selling stuff, everybody's in the queue. And from all these separate cars and things where everyone's traveling around, suddenly you're all there together. And, and there's there's all the old ladies from the bus and the and um the sort of backpackers from Germany and the Netherlands and and everyone's all in there together. And so on the one hand, like my heart would sing when I arrived at it. On the other hand, you really were stepping into the unknown because you didn't know, are we going to be shaken down for a bribe? Are we going to be held there for five hours? Are we going to sail through? Is there just going to be a queue that keeps you there for, for five hours in the baking hot 40 degree Celsius sunshine? And, and so you know, when I think of when I think of um, access to the mystical, I think of like, what would be the right kind of border post that that we would have? And this is where I do get very uh, upset with the way that one taste was treated, because I think that was one of its 
primary gifts and functions was as a good guide to these realms where um, I know for myself, for sure, it gave me an opportunity to go and access the Kabbalah, to go and access Zen Buddhism, to go and access Tibetan Buddhism, to go and access um, ancient rituals and magical rites without being shaken down. Um, and then obviously those the guide gets accused of um, shaking down the participants by overcharging them and and uh, encouraging them to take steps that were not to their benefit. I don't think that that, that holds up. I don't think that the, the, the facts support that. I don't think those are, accusations are true. And we've written a lot about that. Again, I'm speaking personally and not on behalf of One Taste or any other company on this, but I've been involved in these things and I have my personal views on them. And so, um, yeah, as we enter these mystical realms, you know, how do we how do we properly uh, police them? What is the right role of the media? What is the right role of concerned citizens? What is the 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 appropriate way um, to to have guidance around this? And I, one concept I have found personally helpful to myself is this idea of a schema because it helps understand why this is so hard to engage with. And there's a beautiful book by um, Dan Levitin. And the book is called, This is Your Brain on Music, The Science of a Human Obsession. So Dan Levitin is a neuroscientist and a former music producer. He produced for uh, the Grateful Dead for Jonathan Richmond and the Modern Lovers. Not even sure anybody knows who that band is, but I love them um, and, and many others. And so he has this great love of music and then also a neuroscientist and all these wild and crazy experiments um, on, on music and, and its impact on the brain. And one of the things he says about music is like what, what makes music interesting is the right balance between order and irregularity of the elements of the music. So if it's too monotonous, if the beat just never, ever changes, your brain tunes it out because it's, it becomes boring. And so it just simply tunes it out. But if it's too uh, cacophonic, if it's too um, wild and crazy, if there's not enough of a beat, your brain also tunes it out because, um, because it can't track it and it sounds unpleasant. And so a lot of music is just playing between these elements of skillfully manipulating when your brain expects the next beat to arrive so that it produces the sense of delight, so that it produces the sense of awe that you've got this feeling like I just cannot get enough of this song because it's so good. And so these, these tiny little changes. So, but then there are different types of music that play with that in different ways. So jazz has a particular schema. And I've had this myself personally because I listened to jazz for a long time and I was just like, this is making my ears bleed and I'm not enjoying it but it's supposed to be cool and it's supposed to be fun. So I'm going to keep trying, but my ears are bleeding and I want to cry and I want it to stop, but it's Miles Davis and I know that's cool. So I have to keep going. And what I learned through this book, um, which has actually really helped me really enjoy jazz is that once you get exposed to enough of a certain type of thing, you get the schema in your brain. Your brain recognizes the patterns and the template that, that is being played with in this, in this type of music. And I think this applies to the, the mystical and the spiritual as well. They all have their own schema, which you need to bow to and respect uh, if, you, if you wish to, to access that realm. Um, but until you have the familiarity with it, and that's why so many of these realms, you do need a guide to get there because it's the guide that's going to take you from your world and what you understand and what you love and what makes your heart sing 
and show you how it how it relates and give you the schema to um, to approach these things. And I can tell you, for some of them, I had my struggles. You know, like one of the areas of study was something like uh, neuro linguistic programming, which is not so esoteric, more modern. I guess it's sort of Bay Area modern esoteric field of study. And I didn't like this. I mean, I grew up driving in Johannesburg past a sign that had, there was a graffiti wall and you could graffiti whatever, but every month this group that was against NLP and hypnotherapy would paint this terrifying <laughs> picture of somebody's brain kind of exploding and their eyes popping out of their head and the big red veins and stuff. And so that was my only reference point. My schema for NLP was that picture on that wall. And so I did need a guide into this into this world. Um, and, and the same thing with Tibetan Buddhism. I mean, there's all these mantras and this chanting and there's thousands of deities and there's these sadhanas, which are pages and pages of long with just counting different numbers. And you're like, how on earth is this in any way helpful or relevant to me? And um, so, yeah, that's a plug for finding someone who can uh, skillfully guide you in a, into the schema of a different world without bribing you along the way. Um, and um, that, is a, that is a tricky thing to, to keep your mind solid so that you don't collapse into cynicism and suspicion in a way that you couldn't access the realm, but at the same time that you do, um, you know, have an awareness of the dynamics that are unfolding inside of this realm so that they remain safe and that they remain real, basically, you know, the, the whole thing is to keep it real. So that was a bunch that I've said, and um, I think we'll pause it there. We. In terms of this series, we may do one more and then call it a day, or I may get into next week and decide there are a few more that still need to happen and be and be said. But I really am very happy you all joined me, and I have a lot of fun doing these. And I will open it for questions. We'll take about just under 20 minutes of questions um, because I will need to wrap up at about 11.50. If you have a question, uh, raise your hand and I'll call on you. We'll go with Rachel first. It's not less of a question and more of a reflection, which is I just really have enjoyed all of your stories about Africa coming through this particular medium. I haven't heard much of it before and they're always so evocative and the image at the border. I personally have experienced a lot of borders, so I am very familiar with the excitement and anxiety that comes at borders and that kind of all together feeling like you're all on the same boat and it's this um, subway car of people and experiences and I really enjoyed that part. Thanks. We'll go with Maya next. Hello, Professor Williams. It's great to see you. Um, yeah, also, I, don't, I can think of a question, but I just wanted to also reflect just how, how it's just so rich hearing you speak. You can really feel, you know, something like five years of thinking about a topic really being digested, <laughs> digested out and, um, and just how nuanced and how, um, yeah, and and but just really beautifully articulate and really interesting, um, and and then also you just bring in a lot of different perspectives, like both a kind of intellectual perspective and a personal, and then a mystical feminine, and it, and it's just so interesting to hear how um, how your how all of this knowledge and and insight is being digested, and then the I I don't have questions yet, but I just feel it beginning to open up more more um parts of my own consciousness thanks maya next we'll go with nancy hi um i was wondering um i've gotten the feeling like maybe you were surprised at the depths of your interest <clears throat> in this regard um like being a lawyer and maybe more rational and yet 
And yet it seems like quite profound experience for you to be taken in a way into this realm. And so I was wondering if there was anything you want to say about that. Yeah, no, I, I was surprised. And I think like I, I've always had a love for the feminine and and the kind of mystical from an aesthetic perspective. You know, like it's it's beautiful, it's rich, it's evocative. And and I think that's as far as most people take it. You know, they want to see like um what was it? Uh I can't remember the name of the film, but the one with Tom Cruise and Nicole Kidman, where it's this weird cult. Like people want that kind of imagery. What they don't necessarily want is for them for there to be any kind of truth in those kinds of realms. And so I was not surprised that I was attracted to it aesthetically. What I was surprised is, was the depths of truth that lay in there for, for how to live a good life and how to be a good person and how to be more of yourself. And then once I could perceive that, once I had the eyes to be able to see that, then it was made total sense that I'd be interested in it because I've always had this like relentless hunger to know what works and what doesn't work. And, you know, have read very voraciously and, and and try to decode things. And and so, yeah, the, the surprise was knowing how true it was. And then everything from there could, could unfold very naturally and beautifully. Thank you. Joe. Yeah. Hey, Kevin. I, so I really, I really liked your talk because um, in all of them, like there's like, like putting the pieces together because uh, I don't know if it's a, a masculine thing. It's just my experience is like, I know I'm experiencing these other, otherworldly outside the standard, outside the norm experiences. Um, but I don't, uh, but I'm still like kind of, putting the pieces together like it feels like you're kind of doing now it's like and uh so it really helps when you talk through it and I listen and I'm like oh yeah that 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 makes sense that resonates okay yeah I did have I had that fear and I had loathing and uh I thought it was real and oh no maybe that's just because it was this 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 mystical experience um and so my question is um about the schema part um you know i recognize that schema too when i was trying to become a pilot there was a period where there was just so much overwhelming my mind hadn't created it yet i was like screw this like i'm giving up and then and then it clicks but like could you share more a bit about like like i don't know almost like like recognizing the schema for yourself like did you did you did you notice a moment with a seven or what like how do you overcome that barrier between like you know not liking jazz music and and then having it you know and enjoying it yeah well uh the great great question um joe i really i love everybody's questions they're always so awesome um and have me think a lot uh the i mean with the the very first one was around alchemy this notion of alchemy, like turning lead into gold, you know, is part of my mind. Like, of course, you cannot turn lead into gold. It's like I grew up on a gold mine. Like, if you could do it, they would have figured it out. They, they would say, <laughs> like, you know, I grew up around geologists <laughs> and chemists. So, uh, you know, kind of like, oh, that's that's bullshit. And then reading Catherine McCoon's on becoming an alchemist where she sort of posits like, well, maybe they really did do it. I, I don't know about that, but I do know that the spiritual principles that were elucidated and the way of, you know, like just little things that suddenly like made sense to me, which I think gave me a bit of a schema. Like she had this, uh, part, there's a tradition of like creating a room in your mind and, and you, you enter into this meditative space where you create this, you know, a castle or a palace, or it could be modernist and concrete and glass or full of plants or an old, however it is. And suddenly I could really relate to that in a way that once I could do that and be like, oh, this is very rewarding for me. And rationally, it makes a lot of sense that instead of 
you know, panicking and worrying about, am I a good person and am I doing it right? I'm filling this mental space inside my mind with, uh, you know, objects of beauty that resonate with my soul. And of course, that would affect how I speak to the next person. And of course, that would affect what I eat for lunch, whether I pick the healthy, clean option or whether I pick something really heavy that's just going to put me to sleep. Uh, let's do another one. Like, um, I think drawing, like drawing is something that sort of always struck me as this like beautiful thing that I want to attain, but I can't. And it's, it's so hard. And then somebody shows you, like, if you make the hips like this and the pelvis like that and the breastplate like that and the shoulders like this, suddenly you can, you can do it. And literally your brain has a schema for how to construct a human body from your mind, which is a kind of a miraculous thing in the way that the eye would register it. So uh, that sort of practice and repetition, but with a guide that can help bring it alive for you. What's another one? I think, I think those are two, at least two examples of, well, let's, and let's try this Buddhist one because that was one I, did struggle with. I mean, we have this um, uh, Lama, Lama Glenn Mullen, who's from the the sort of um, tantric school of Buddhism, the, the um, uh, Vajra, the sort of, there's the Mahayana and there's the Vajrayana, and he's from the Vajrayana school. And it's so complex and and, and rich, but he has a way of explaining it in 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 very some well you know you know Lama Glenn um so he has a way of explaining it in really fun terms like you know you and your friends or driving from A to B and you know you've suddenly killed a thousand insects and how does that affect your karma and and what does that mean about you know awakening and enlightenment so having someone who can break it down in a way that feels true and real um, without losing any of the complexity is, is important for that. Real good. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. I feel like you have another question behind that, that I haven't answered, but maybe we'll take that one offline and I'll see if I can <laughs> crack it for you. <laughs> any final questions? Now's the time. I had a thought and I don't, it's kind of weird, but it's something like, you know, maybe the shakedown that like we're nervous that everyone's nervous about. I think there's a way that you can take the shakedown as part of spiritual experience. And like, I don't know. And I don't, I just heard that thought in my head and um, like as a way where, you know, I think that we all can feel and know when something is like on or off and it's ways where we, like disown our own knowing and then make it the other person sort of responsible. Um, and so, yeah, I kind of feel like, oh, there's no way you can really escape spiritual development in a certain way. Like it'll come to you whether or not you want it. And it's just like, will you take the invitation or not? Um, so I just had that thought and I wanted to share it. Yeah, that's that's true. And then, you know, I always I'm a lawyer, so I, I kind of take everything to extremes. And I always think of the most extreme example I can, which is the Jim Jones um, People's Temple and how you got, you know, this he was a he was a civil rights activist. He was a very powerful, magnetic, charismatic speaker. He had, um, you know, um, the first large mixed race uh kind of congregation i think in the u.s and to go from what you could rationally even you could see like oh this is why i want to be involved in this community to ordering you know 900 of them 300 of them children like drink this poisoned kool-aid until you die in service of your spiritual growth you know it's like that is some intense shit. You know, that's some really, really intense shit. So I never want to be like glib about these things. Right. That's but why the, I wanted to bring it up. It's because yeah. like, there's so much richness behind like what is this thought and what's behind there. And yeah. And then, yeah. you know, but I know the other thing it makes me think of is, is yoga. Uh, there's this great, great article, which probably in the next session, I do want to get more into it in sort of teasing it this whole time. But 
there's this great article on fear of yoga and a book about it from the Columbia Journalism Review. Um, title is Fear of Yoga. And I think it goes into how, you know, yoga kind of started as a often genuine, certain schools of yoga were genuinely fairly rough and tumble. You know, there were these like kind of carnival type characters who would roll into your mm -hmm. town, do all these uh, tricks, get people to give you money, kind of pickpocket everybody who was there and steal a few children to become yogi adepts on their way to the next town. You know, like these were not, you know, these were some, some rough characters who were on this path and they were partly on the path because it was beautiful and wonderful. And they were partly on the path because you got to go around and be guaranteed an income. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, it's, and, and then it's like, I, th I think this is where dualistic th thinking is what gets us in trouble. Like this demand for absolute safety and, and any, we will kill any kind of benefit so that this never happens again uh, versus the ability to see all sides of the thing and, and allow it to be all of what it is and then put in place guardrails. Like, no, you, you, you can do your little yoga tricks but you cannot kidnap the children, um, you know, and, and said, so that's where this idea of like, what would an awakened policing or enlightened policing of these realms look like? Right. Yeah. That's a really cool question. Thank you. Okay. Well, that seems like a fun note to, to end it on. Thanks everyone for joining. I love seeing all of you and, um, yeah, look forward to seeing you all on the Eris platform. I, I like plugging things. So today I'm going to plug the Principles Sutra book. Uh, it's available for pre-order. A lot of people on this call and many of us were, were, were very blessed to read the sutras as they were being written. And so the sutra would be written about 5.30 in the morning. It would be posted on a thread we would all read it and instantly write our own reflection on what it means to us and from our life. And, and um, it's the sutras are this rich practice where you get to be with yourself. And we're doing all these cool things like Aggie does a sutra reading, um, a 10 minute sutra reading. There's today, actually, there's a first sutra reading group where you read some of the sutra and you engage with it. And so it's this beautiful melding of, you know, Nicole who who practices for her whole life, and this was the sort of distillation of that, versus your own experience and a time to invest in your own spirit and your own soul and in some soul making, so that you emerge, you know, richer and 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 happier and more pleasant to be around. So, go pre-order the sutras. Come on to the sutra study group. Uh, it makes a big difference when we get those pre-orders in and we know that, you know, people are interested and people are coming and it's going to be a beautiful book. I think we're just waiting for the dummy copy to arrive uh, so we can see what it looks like. And it's going to be really fantastic. So thanks so much and see you all soon. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.